Okay, we're live. And people are starting to come into the room. All right, as people are entering the room, I just want to let uh, everybody know we'll start in about one minute. And um, Gary, do you want us to uh, leave our mics muted so that we have to click in order to speak or? No, go ahead and just uh, leave them unmuted and. Yeah, so that we don't forget. Okay. Right. All right, it's uh, 8.02. Um, let's go ahead and get started. So good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to Morning Scoop and I'm Gary Grotto, the executive editor of the Arizona Capital Times. And for the next hour, we've got four distinguished panelists who are gonna talk about elections in the coming year. And a lot has happened in the last three years related to elections. And next year, we're gonna have three statewide elections. So our panelists are here today to talk about what's on the horizon with new election laws, major political spending, voter participation, civic engagement, um, election security, you name it. And uh, they're gonna talk about how it's gonna affect the voter. So, um, we wouldn't be here today to talk about all this without our sponsor, the Arizona Clean Elections Commission. Um, a little bit about the Arizona Clean Elections Commission. You know, voters passed the uh, Clean Elections Act in 1998, creating the Citizens Clean Elections Commission, which provides public funding to qualified candidates, campaign finance enforcement. It manages the Clean Elections Fund and it provides voter education. And the commission's mission is to implement and administer the Citizens Clean Elections Act fairly, faithfully, and fully, and to improve the integrity of Arizona state government and promote uh, public confidence in the Arizona political process. And a big thank you to the uh, Clean Elections Commission. Now I'd like to turn it over, turn the floor over to uh, Gina Roberts, the Voter Education Director for the Clean Elections Commission to give us some introductory remarks and um, talk to, you know, tell us about what we're gonna be discussing today. Good morning, Gina. Good morning, Gary. Uh, first, thank you so much to the Arizona Capital Times for hosting these informative morning scoop sessions um, at Clean Elections. Our goal is to educate voters across the entire state of Arizona and opportunity to get together uh, some very experienced uh, could speak to different topics that will impact voters uh, next year as we look forward to our three statewide elections. It being a presidential election year, we know that voter turnout will typically be higher and the rules change from each election that, that will be going on. And there's also gonna be some local elections too. So I'm very grateful to our panelists who have uh, dedicated their time to us today to speak to some of these issues, all in the goal of helping the voters prepare uh, for the 2024 elections so that they can participate. Um, a little bit more about Clean Elections. Uh, we are the sponsor today. I serve as the Voter Education Director for the Clean Elections Commission. And as I mentioned, our goal really is to reach voters across the entire state to provide them factual, official, uh, nonpartisan election information so they can participate. You may know us through our voter education guide that we send to every household before the primary and general election and through our debates and also through our website, azcleanelections.gov, which we work very closely with our county election officials to provide voters, um, again, the most accurate up-to-date information so that they can participate. So um, once again, thank you to the uh, Arizona Capital Times and to our distinguished panelists. I'm very excited for you all to hear what um, they have to share with you, again, all in the goal of helping voters prepare for our upcoming presidential election year. So thank you so much. Um, and again, thank you, Gary, for having us today. 
Thank you, Gina, and uh, great job as usual. And now I'd like to introduce our panelists and ask each of them to tell you a little bit about themselves and any remark, any opening remarks if they wish. So um, our first panelist is Senator Ken Bennett. He represents Legislative District 1, and his resume includes being the former Senate President and a former Secretary of State. Uh, Senator Bennett, good morning. Good morning, Gary. I was, uh, I'm a born and raised Arizonan. I was born in Tucson, and but have spent most of my life up here in the Prescott area. And as you noted, I represent uh, Legislative District 1, which is essentially Yavapai County. I was in the Senate for eight years back uh, around 99 to 2007, and now I'm back in the Senate. I am the vice chair of the Elections Committee, uh, chair of the Education Committee. Great, thank you, uh, Senator. And our next panelist and second elected official is Gabriela Cazares Kelly, the Pima County Recorder. She took office in 2021. Good morning, uh, Recorder Cazares Kelly. Good morning. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Gabriela Casares Kelly. I'm from the communities of Pismo'o and Kuk, which are located on the Thonotham Reservation, um, which is right here in beautiful Pima County, where I serve as the county recorder. I am responsible for voter registration and early voting for more than 630,000 registered voters and counting. Uh, we process voter registrations every single day. Um, and we also are responsible for public documents, mostly property documents. And we have over 9 million in our repository, um, meaning that we have, this is really about data um, and ensuring the security of data. Great, thank you. And next is uh, Roy Herrera. Um, he's a partner with Herrera Ariano, and he's also um, uh, very well versed in election law. Uh, good morning, Roy. Uh, good morning, Gary, uh, and thanks for having me back on a morning scoop. It's always a pleasure to be on one of these. And of course, uh, Gina and the Clean Elections Commission, I really appreciate the invite. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a political law attorney, which primarily means that I'm an election law and campaign finance lawyer. So obviously we're heading into kind of the Super Bowl uh, next year with uh, the November elections. Um, so happy to talk about new developments and what we can expect next year. All right. Uh, thank you, Roy. So um, now I'd like to talk about the chat real quick. Um, we've opened it up for the audience to submit questions to the panel. And I'll try to get to as many as I can as the time allows. And we just ask that you please be civil and please use it only to submit questions and not chat with each other or chat with other audience members. Um, when that happens, it starts clogging up the, the chat and it's hard to find the actual questions. So um, if you could just submit questions that we'd be uh, really uh, appreciate that. So thank you. Um, now for what you've all tuned in for, um, Gina, uh, tell us about the elections that are coming up in, in 2024. Sure. Yeah. So uh, next year is going to be very busy for voters. We have three statewide elections next year. So the first that voters will uh, experience will be in March for our presidential preference election. Um, and there's always a lot of confusion about what a presidential preference election is and who can participate. And so essentially what the presidential preference election is, is where political parties opt in to participating in this election. And it's an opportunity for their affiliated voters to say, this is our preferred candidate for running for president. Um, so in 2024, in our PPE next year in March, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party are going to participate in that. So that means that only those voters who are registered with those political parties can participate, which means that our independent voters, which we have a very large portion of those in the state of Arizona, they are not eligible to participate. So again, there's a lot of confusion about the PPE. And so um, one of the things that election officials try to stress is uh, who can participate. And we want to make sure that our independent voters know that um, you are not eligible to vote in the PPE, only those voters. So in this case, it would be Republican voters and Democratic voters 
voters uh, can vote in the PPE. And again, the purpose of that is to tell your party, this is who we want our presidential candidate to be. So what happens after the PPE, what the parties do with that knowledge, with that information, is they'll go on to their national conventions. And at the national conventions during the summertime, uh, the delegates for the state of Arizona are going to tell the national party, this is who Arizona stated is their top candidate uh, for running for president. And then at the convention, where the political parties will decide their official nominee of um, the presidential candidate that will appear on the ballot. So that's really the purpose of our PPE. Um, again, that's going to be held in March of 2024. Um, we will also have some local jurisdictional elections during that time. So it's very important for voters to be aware of, um, you know, what elections they're eligible to participate in. And then after the March PPE, we get into our August primary election. And I'd like to clarify for voters, the August primary will have absolutely nothing on the ballot related to the presidential election. So we have our presidential preference election in March. We jump forward to our August primary. Nothing on the August primary will be related to the presidential election. So what's the purpose of our August primary and who can vote in it? Our August primary is for um, voters to say, these are the nominees that we want to advance to the general election to uh, compete against one another on that general election ballot. Now, here's the difference. In our August primary, anybody can vote in it including our independents. So every registered voter can vote in the August primary, including independents. Um, independent voters do have to take a, a step where they need to tell their election official which party ballot they want to vote because they can only pick one. Uh, and ballots in the primary are arranged by party. So you have a Republican ballot, you have a Democratic ballot, um, and, and the other parties as well too. So voters um, who are independent, they have to, if they want to vote in the August primary, they have to select which one. And then, uh, Gary, we're going to jump forward to our November presidential uh, election. That's where we're going to see all of the nominees from the August primary uh, competing against one another on the general election ballot. And that's where we will see our presidential electors as well. And that's where you'll be voting for those electors, um, which will ultimately vote for, for president. So that's what we have looking forward to next year for our three statewide elections. Thank you, Gina. And a uh, question for um, re re recorder Kazaris Kelly. Um, you know, Gina mentioned that the independents can vote in the primary. How do um, uh, how does a person let the uh, election office let you know that they want to want to do that? Um, well, two things. Number one, it's really important for us to remember that um, there is no independent party in the, uh, the state of Arizona. We we use that term. Um, independence, but it's anybody who has no party designated. So that it also includes currently the Green Party. I know that they're filing um, to become a, a party again, um, but until then, they're considered no party designated. So anybody who doesn't have a party is considered um, no party designated or or otherwise we, we refer to them as independent. Um, for any of those voters, no party designated, they're able to either show up in person and simply state, I would like a Democratic or a Republican ballot. Um, if they um, will be sending, all counties will be sending out 90, what we call internally 90 day notices, where we actually will send a notice to anybody who is on the active early voting list. They will get um, either a letter or a postcard um, in the mail with the dates um, that we're mailing out the ballots. And that way people can look ahead on their calendars and say, oh, I'm not going to be here to receive that ballot. Um, I would like it sent to a different location or no, please don't send it to me. I'm going to vote in person. Um, so we do it through the mail in that way. We also um, are able to take those requests online um, and over the phone. All right. Thank you. Now, um, coming up this year, uh, you know, the projections have been that um, there's going to be $821 million spent in uh, the next year on elections and campaigns. And so, Roy, um, what, what's that going to look like for the voters? 
Well, I mean, you're right. I, I think that Arizona, because of all of the races, the important races that Gina outlined, and in particular, how close all of these races are going to be. I mean, we're talking about razor thin, you know, margins of victory in, in, in probably all of the races that are at least statewide next year, presidential, Senate. Um, this is kind of the epicenter of political spending nationally. I wouldn't be surprised if Arizona ends up becoming, you know, the most expensive state in the country when it comes to campaign finance spending. So practically speaking, I think what that means to most voters is you're going to get very annoyed at the television ads because you're going to be seeing more television ads, um, you know, starting next year than you've probably ever seen before uh, on TV, on your digital apps, like, you know, basically anywhere um, there's a screen in front of you, you're going to see ads. So I think that is just on a day to day basis what people are going to experience. I think, though, that there is we're, we're on kind of the campaign finance um, realm of things there is going to be a paradigm shift a bit in campaign finance because of the passage of Prop 211. This was a initiative that was passed by voters last year uh, in Arizona, overwhelmingly by Arizonans. And the point of the initiative, uh, and I'm obviously like, you know, can, uh, paraphrasing a little bit, uh, is to uh, bring to light the donors that are contributing to organizations that spend money on politics, basically. It's an anti-dark money initiative. Um, so basically, we should theoretically, as a result of this initiative, have a lot more understanding about which donors are funding what. Um, and I know the Clean Elections Commission is doing um, the hard work of promulgating rules related to uh, Prop 211 to give us a better understanding of how we're all supposed to comply but we are in a world now where we're going to have to, if you're if you're spending money, if you're an organization that's spending money on politics, on partisan politics, you're probably going to have to disclose your donors. You're probably going to have to disclose your donors' donors. And that really is going to be different than we've had in prior years. There's a lot of questions about that. I mean, just from like almost the political science perspective, like, does that mean that we'll be less spending because people don't want to reveal their donors? You know, I don't know. That all remains to be seen. But next year, we will see that law in effect and, and theoretically have a lot more information about, you know, who's contributing. Now, where can a voter um, go to find that information if they want so, to find the, the, yeah, the yes. donors and the donors' donors? So that's an interesting question. I mean, um, we will, and again, I kind of go back to the point where we're we're still trying to implement this. I mean, by we, I really mean the Clean Elections Commission and the Secretary of State. I I, I don't do the hard work. I just sort of watch. They, they're the ones that actually do the hard work. Um, but we're we're getting um, that implemented. And what I mean by that is there will be a reporting regime, which is not up and running yet, but there will be. Um, and you would be able to sort of go just like you would now uh, to go view campaign finance reports. And you would be able to see the reports that are being filed as a result of what Prop 211 requires. Prop 211 also has some disclaimer requirements that are slightly different than the disclaimer requirements that we've had before. So that would mean that on a disclaimer that you see on the ads, you, depending on the type of ad and, and who's funding it, you will see more information on the ads themselves about who is funding that particular ad. Gary, can I jump in on that too? Um, and, and Roy, thank you for all of that great information. And one of the things that stands out to me, and I'm not sure if if Recorder Casares Kelly wants to chime in on this too, or, or even uh, Senator Bennett, but with all of this influx of messaging that will hit Arizona voters, you know, it's going to be difficult to try to sift through that and, and figure out, okay, you know, this information that I'm getting, you know, it's a, it's a little, little bit of an overload, maybe, you know, where do I go to get that accurate official election information? But we know that one of the um, struggles that we've had over the past few years is misinformation. And so I think it's really important for voters that, you know, if you're coming across something, you know, pause and think, you know, how do I verify this information? And that's where we want to point you to your county recorders, to your county elections offices, to the Secretary of State's office, to clean elections, to get that accurate election information. Because we know that, you know, folks are, are very passionate and, and, you know, the vote is so important. And we want to make sure that voters have, um, you know, accurate information about what is actually happening uh, with the election process. And so I, I just, again, as Roy mentioned, and, and Gary, you mentioned with the amount of political dollars that are going to be spent on, you know, mostly probably, you know, vote for me for candidates advertising, I just want to throw in that note about there still is, you know, this uh, potential threat of misinformation, and we want to make sure voters know where to go to get accurate information. Thank you, Gina. And so um, I, I'm going to jump back to uh, Prop 211 here in a few minutes, but I wanted to, to get to Senator uh, Bennett because I didn't want him to sit there for too much longer. I'm um, having a glorious time, so I'm just good. 
<laughs> I, I would I would take the opportunity before you come up with whatever question you have, Gary, to um, kind of piggyback on what the other three have said so far that the counties in Arizona actually conduct the elections. So when you're looking for official information, uh, the best thing to do is know how to get your county recorder and your county election department. The recorder is a state or a countywide elected official. As uh, recorder Cazares Kelly mentioned, uh, the recorder does voter registration and the mail-in balloting, early voting. But there's an election department in each county, usually under the responsibility of the Board of Supervisors, that actually prints the ballots and does everything related to the election day voting. Uh, the tabulation of the ballots, the certification of the machines and all of that. So uh, when we think of an election being held in Arizona, there is no such thing. There's really 15 elections held every time we have an election. And then the results from the 15 counties are forwarded to the Secretary of State's office. Secretary of State is identified in the state constitution and statutes as the chief elections official. Um, but really, they just kind of add all of the county results together to come up with statewide totals. But the real nuts and bolts of elections happening in Arizona happen at each of the 15 counties. Thank you, Senator. So um, what I wanted to ask you was um, you and, and Recorder Cazares Kelly are on the uh, governor's um, elections task force. And I think you just wrapped up your work. Can you each of you talk a little bit about what, what you've done and um, what's coming down or what's coming next with that. Well, um, the governor did uh, put together an elections task force uh, and recorder Kazada Skelly and I and about uh, what, 18, 17, 18 others uh, were on that uh, task force. Uh, it was subdivided into five groups. There was election administration, voter registration, uh, early voting, uh, election day and post-election procedures, and then uh, equipment and security. And out of that whole process came about 15 or 16 recommendations. Some of those, uh, I think, can be implemented um, without legislation. Some of them will require some legislation. So there were two legislators on the, the task force, myself and Representative Laura Tarek uh, from down in the Phoenix area. Uh, we're coordinating. Uh, Laura's Democrat, I'm Republican, we're coordinating between the two of us as to which pieces of legislation need to be introduced uh, in the next legislative session in January to uh, see if we can get buy-in from, uh, from the rest of the legislators. The, the three most important numbers in Arizona are 16, 31, and 1. To pass any law or change any law, you've got to get 16 of the 30 senators 31 of the 60 representatives in the House and the governor to sign that bill. And so there are, there are a few of those recommendations, but I don't really think that most of the recommendations are earth changing recommendations. Uh, there's, you know, stuff about um, allowing certification of election officials to happen every year instead of every other year. There's uh, making sure that all counties use their provisional ballot uh, form uh, so that the voter can automatically get registered and not have to fill out another form to get registered if they weren't. Um, but there's some funding things and anything that's new funding from the legislature will, uh, will end up uh, in the debate of the state budget. And, and there's other things that we're going to be debating uh, because of the closeness of our elections. Roy mentioned how, you know, we are a very, closely divided state, and at least for the last several cycles, uh, some of these major elections have been won by very narrow majorities. Uh, because of that, there's concern that we don't have enough time between the August primary that Gina was referring to and the general election in November to, if there's a close election and we need to recount, for example, and the legislature a few years ago changed the recount threshold to now uh, a, a larger amount so that um, there could be there could be two or three races that have to be recounted because they are within that recount threshold. So the, one of the big debates we'll have in the legislature next year is what can we do to kind of squeeze a few, I think most of the election officials are saying they need maybe 
a couple more weeks or 18 to 19 days uh, somehow built into the system to make sure that we can get everything done between the primary and the general in November. All right. And which which one of those recommendations are going to need legislation? Like, uh, I guess the the hot the hot button ones or the, you know, major ones that you guys talked about. Um, for example, one was that uh, there there should be cross county voter registration, that if a voter is registered in one of the 15 counties, but they move right before the election and they show up in one of the other counties uh, to vote on Election Day, uh, you know, there should be some mechanism for them to do so right now. We cut off voting 29 days before an election in Arizona. And so each of the 15 counties has a, a set um, domain of who were the registered voters authorized to vote in that county. And you have to vote in that county uh, based on that cutoff 29 days before. If we were to go to a cross-county voter registration, there would be some legislation requiring that. Um, what do you, what, can, can you remember any others, uh, Gabriella, that? Uh, uh, I, um, yeah. I think there was think one that, that was had the, the largest had one. Balance? Um, that one, <laughs> that was one of the, the pieces where uh, Senator Bennett and I did not uh, agree. Uh, do you want to talk about that a little bit? I didn't hear Gary qu Gary's question. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think there was one um, recommendation that had to do with uh, felons getting the, the right to vote as soon as they, you know, walk out. Yes, the, the committee uh, recommended, um, although I personally... Uh, did not support it. Most most of the most of the recommendations were unanimously adopted. Uh, there was one uh, that had a no vote, and it was me. And that was one that said, um, as soon as a felon is released from being incarcerated for their crime, they should automatically be restored to being able to vote. I uh, my position then, and it uh, was that, and still is that. There are other aspects of their penalty, such as probation, uh, restitution to victims, uh, paying fines and penalties uh, that I believe should also have to be fulfilled in order to have those voting rights restored. But the committee as a whole, the majority of the committee uh, liked the idea of automatically restoring voting rights as soon as they are released from incarceration. So uh, as it is right now, uh, it, that would take uh, legislation to change that. And we'll just have to see if the votes are in the legislature for one or the other way. So to, I, I'd love to talk about this one um, in particular. So first of all, at the majority of the of the proposals that came out of the governor's office had they were very practical. They were practical solutions that um, elections directors and recorders um, and the secretary of state's office were already seeing, um, as well as municipalities. So these are there are situations that you know we're running into on an on a cycle by cycle basis that are just you know like we like we said earlier um, you know making sure that we have a secretary of state uh, certification every year uh, that that's difficult for us uh, because we have new people coming in every cycle and we're trying to build up. Um, a larger force. Uh, some of our offices don't need to have 100 staff members uh, for two years running, um, but we will in a presidential election cycle. Um, and so so a lot of the solutions were very practical. The the um, rights rest voting rights restoration piece um, that actually started as a conversation um, regarding a way it was there a uniform way that we could determine who was had a felony conviction and who didn't um right now if a voter is registered and they get a felony conviction we get an automatic notice from the secretary of state's office however if somebody already had a felony conviction um years ago 20 years ago 30 years ago um, and registers to vote, there's really no way for us to, to go in and go through all of the different jurisdictions. There is no one unifying, you know, um, system database that exists. There's nothing. And so we would have to figure that out by by jurisdiction of, of how to find that information. 
Um, and we started talking about a commission. That was a, an early conversation that we had within um, within the task force. And then as we, we started really pulling it apart and who would sit on this, who would decide who would sit on this, what are the resources that we were implementing, who would house the data, how would we um, receive reports? All of those things were extremely complex and it was very, we were starting to see the price tag just shoot up um, and all for um, us to uh, allow people to vote. And, you know, recognizing that there is voting in prisons in other countries and that um, voting rights have really largely been impacted by um, historical decisions like um, when people eliminated, uh, when we eliminated slavery uh, and it, having to do with emancipation. Um, and so that took on a larger conversation about whether or not, you know, we were going to use all of these resources simply to determine somebody's um, capability of being able to participate. And, you know, there are people here in the community who are using the roads and the hospitals and the libraries and all of the things that we're making decisions on, and they're still a part of our community. And so that's that's where that uh, eventually led to. We, we recognize this is what other states are doing. They're moving towards... Uh, automatic voting rights restoration upon release. And uh, the majority of the team, <laughs> minus one, uh, felt felt that that was uh, in line. Well, I'm sure that'll be a hot topic if it gets to the legislature and gets a committee hearing. So, um, uh, Roy, um, what is, you know, we spoke a little bit about Prop 211. Um, what else is going on in, as far as, you know, election law uh, litigation? as we speak. Yeah, there's there's a lot going on, actually. I mean, there's there's a number of pending lawsuits right now um, that, you know, theoretically are going to be decided before next November and will affect how we, you know, will conduct our elections. Um, probably the, the, the most current and important one that's happening is actually happening down in federal court down the street. Um, there's now in week two of a trial uh, in federal court related to a law that was passed and signed uh, into law a couple years ago in Arizona related to proof of citizenship. Um, this would require uh, voters who want to vote in federal elections to uh, provide a, a proof of citizenship to register and to vote. Um, this is in direct contravention of, of prior U.S. Supreme Court precedent from about 10 years ago, also coming from a case in Arizona. That's a case where, I mean, uh, regardless of what happens in trial, it's going to be appealed. It'll probably go all the way back to the U.S. Supreme Court again. Um, so that's one you know, example. Um, I think there's also a couple in Yavapai County that are currently pending that are very important in, uh, to monitor. Uh, one has to do with the signature verification process. Um, as we all know, um, the, the county recorders, uh, you know, the, the actual counties that run the elections do a signature verification. When you send in your early ballot, they look at your signature, they compare that signature to other signatures they have in the registration record of a voter um, in order to verify the signature. That lawsuit challenges the types of documents that uh, the counties can actually look at to do that verification. Uh, the plaintiffs in that case are arguing that some documents that recorders have looked at in the past, like, uh, you know, shouldn't be actually looked at. So it would narrow the kind of exemplars you'd be able to use. Uh, I should also preface, by the way, that in all these lawsuits I'm talking about, I'm actually involved in them. So I obviously have some, <laughs> I have some viewpoint, uh, but I'm trying to, uh, to try to be as objective as possible. There's a more recent case in Yavapai, Yavapai County challenging the use of drop boxes, um, which is, uh, you know, a fairly common practice, particularly in rural Arizona. Uh, by election officials and whether drop boxes are allowed. Um, you know, those two cases are going to be very important um, because it's going to change again, you know, how things uh, are conducted, um, how voters can vote. Um, the other thing I guess just quickly mention is uh, we talked a little bit about um, the Green Party, you know, No Labels uh, is a different political party that actually is a recognized political party in Arizona as of today. Um, I actually tried to challenge to get that um, certification uh, decertified, but that was unsuccessful. Uh, so they are a political party, but they themselves have now sued um, uh, the Secretary of State in order to prevent people from running under the, the no labels ticket as a no labels candidate for any election other than president. 
Um, so theoretically, their, their argument there is that no one that, you know, is running for legislature, for example, can run as no labels. So we'll see sort of what happens there, because if, if, if that goes the other way, you could start seeing no labels candidates pop up in legislative races, for example, things like that. So there's, host, there's a whole host of, of pending election lawsuits that are important. And I think we're going to see a whole lot more. Um, we're very close, I think, um, to having a, a new election procedures manual. Um, in the next, um, you know, hopefully by the end of the year, uh, as is statutorily required. Um, and so, you know, when that happens, depending on what that manual looks like, I can also see maybe some challenges related to that. And that's all before we get to certification and, you know, election day itself and all of that stuff, which is going to be very litigious, let's just say. And, you know, there's kind of a, a routine process for um, like hotly contested races um well hotly contested races where you know the road to election is through the court i mean can you kind of go through that and what what are kind of the routine things that uh you know organizations people will do to uh challenge these and and when they're uh you know these challenges are filed yeah well, Arizona law has a very specific set of statutes related to election challenges. Um, and in addition, as um, uh, Senator Bennett mentioned, we also have very specific rules related to recounts. Um, now, the recount statute, as was mentioned, has been slightly changed. So as far as what the threshold is for the recount, but the process for the recount remains the same, just like the process for election challenges. You know, I've been doing this for a, a long time. Um, it was much more rare uh, to see the kind of election challenges we've seen over the last few years. It's really been since 2020, and in particular after the last election cycle, where we just saw a whole rash of election challenge type lawsuits. I mean, some of them weren't named that way, but they were effectively that. Um, and I think that we will see a lot more of those. Um, you know, one can sort of like guess on why we see more of that. I mean, I would say, you know, the, the sort of Trump lake wing of the Republican Party uh, is challenged at least more often the results of, of prior elections. And certainly after 2022, that happened quite a bit. So I'm sort of guessing and assuming um, that that same, you know, sort of type of candidate um, is probably going to do the same in the 2024 or after the 2024 election, um, because that's just seemingly what the practice is uh, there. Well, it, it seemed like, um, you know, they were on the losing end most of the time. Uh, I mean, do you think you'll you'll see new? Yeah, Gary, Gary, win, winners, winners of elections rarely challenge the election. So yes, right. it's usually the losers. <laughs> that's that right. Thank you for saying that. I, I didn't want to say that, Secretary Bennett, <laughs> but that's true. <laughs> and so, and if, uh, if we could, if we could, I want to make sure there was some uh, reference to what races are coming up next year. Um, but I wanted to be clear for the viewers. Um, most of our statewide races are four-year offices, like governor and secretary of state and attorney general, things like that. Obviously, this, the president of the United States office is a four-year office. The U.S. senators are six-year offices, so those sometimes happen on uh, funny schedules. Uh, but Arizona kind of does a, every two years, we do one or the other. So in 2022, we did most of the statewide offices, governor, secretary of state, attorney general, and, and two or three uh, treasurer and some others. Um, this is the year for the presidential election, but because the congressional districts, the, the congressmen and women, there's nine in Arizona, and all 90 legislators in Arizona come up every two years, this is the year for the presidential race. One of the U.S. Senate races is up again. Um, all nine congressional seats are up. There's a couple of seats on the Arizona Corporation Commission, which are four-year seats, but there's five commissioners. And so three come up one time and two the next. This is the, I think the two year, isn't, isn't it, Gina? Uh, three, we're gonna vote for three. three. This is the three, yeah, this is mm -hmm. three. So three of the corporation commission seats come up and then all 90 legislative seats, both in the Senate and the House. So those are the races that are coming up this year. Uh, obviously it was, was noted by some of the other panelists, uh, the, the, the most noted one is the US presidential race. Uh, I, I, I got a question here while you were you know, mentioning, you know, all the races and um, coming up. Uh, 
there's a question, you know, from the audience, what can be done about ballot fatigue where the ballot is so long that people quit voting before they complete their ballot? Um, I don't know who can answer that, but I'll jump Gina's in raising on that. Your hand. <laughs> well, so, and, and I, I kind of, sure. So I'll jump to that question. And, and then I wanted to provide a, a comment to on what some of the other panelists were saying. Uh, so regarding ballot fatigue, you know, one of the great things about um, Arizona and our elections is we have early voting, right? So, so voters, Voting actually begins 27 days before Election Day. Election Day is really the deadline for voting. And so voters have options on how they want to cast their ballot. Do they prefer to vote early? Do they prefer prefer to go on Election Day? So if you prefer to vote early, you're going to get your ballot, you know, maybe 26, 25 days prior to the election once, you know, it goes out in the mail. And so you have some time there. That's the great thing about it is that you can sit in the comfort of your home and you can look at those double-sided ballots you can spend some time researching the candidates and the issues. And yes, it is a lot. It is, you know, we have everything ranging from presidential electors. You know, we're going to have um, on the November ballot our, our uh, judicial retention elections, which really adds a lot uh, to the ballot real estate there. And then you're going to have your local elections, too. So very important decisions are going to be made next year and it will take some time and so it's very important that voters decide okay what's the best method for for myself for voting and getting my ballot so that i know that i have the time to look at these candidates and the issues so i can make my informed vote um you know and, and again to help with that ballot fatigue having that uh, early voting uh, period can assist with that and so maybe we do have voters who well obviously we do um we have voters who prefer to vote on election day um which is going to be you know i think about 89 percent of of ballots cast in some of the previous elections were done early and and so we know that we still have um some folks who like to go vote on election day and that's wonderful and the great thing about that if you're an election day voter is 11 days before the election you're going to get a sample ballot in the mail so you still have some time to take a look at what's going to be on your ballot and do the research so that you can really make those decisions in advance of you going to the polls on election day and and uh, filling out that ballot so you know i think the best thing that we can do in regards to ballot fatigue is allow voters to have that time so that they can space it out with what works best and is most convenient for them to do the research on those issues. Um, I wanted to jump back to um, some of the, the you know, previous discussion. We had talked about, you know, the early, some of the um, litigation that, that's occurring and, and Senator Bennett had talked about what's going to be on the ballot. And I want to point out too, you know, with the upcoming procedures manual, there are layers upon layers of um, processes that are in place for election officials to ensure the inte integrity of the election. And while we have the judicial process, right, which, which we absolutely need for candidates who want to challenge those results, um, you know, that is absolutely a mechanism that is built into those processes. But when we are looking at how the election officials are conducting the election, you know, the procedures manual is a great document that lays out those those um, steps that all, uh, all 15 counties need to follow. But we're talking about security measures that are built in such as our logic and accuracy testing, where before counties even begin to tabulate your precious vote, they have to verify that the machines are, are counting correctly. Um, we have, as we talked about a little bit here with um, automatic recounts, we have hand, uh, sample hand counts too, where we're looking at a, a random portion of the ballots and hand counting those as well to make sure that they add up. Um, recorder Kassaris Kelly had mentioned that uh, a notice is going out to voters well in advance of the election um, to say, hey, you know, maybe, you know, you're going to get your ballot or, you know, select your ballot. That is going to folks who are registered and are, you know, already been verified for their voter registration. And that's an opportunity for the voter to say, you know, oh, you know what, I'm moving or, you know, maybe that mail gets returned. And now the county has this information that, OK, I possibly have a, a voter that has moved. Let's initiate our next checks and balances process to verify if that voter still at that address. So I think I just wanted to go back and say, while we have, you know, absolutely, there's there's the role of the courts in our electoral system. And, you know, there's mechanisms for candidates to challenge the results. Um, you know, I think going back to what you said, Gary, you, you know, maybe some, most of those were on the losing end. I think actually all of them were any and challenging the, the results of the election um, that 
there are procedures in place to ensure the integrity of the vote. And I just wanted to make sure that our voters and our audience knew that our election officials are following those procedures and that we can have confidence in the election. Thank you, Gina. And um, we have a question from the audience and we were gonna touch on this, uh, this subject, uh, we had planned to touch on this. And so the question is, is and, and I think uh, recorder Casares Kelly can be the first one to answer. Is anything being done to prevent intimidation and or harassment of election workers and to provide security at polling stations? So this is one of the uh, one of the proposals that was sent uh, from the bipartisan task force to, um, you know, that that is going to be going to the legislature uh, because we definitely need guidance on that. Um, we did have paramilitary um uh, observers uh, taking it upon themselves to intimidate um, constituents and 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 intimidate voters. Uh, that has been a really large concern across the entire state. Um, every single recorder is concerned with that uh, because you know that is something that could disenfranchise uh, voters. We don't want people feeling intimidated um, when they go to to participate in our democracy. That should not be happen happening for anybody. And so, you know that it, we need some we need some guidance um, on that. And we hope that the legislature um, will will push for having very clear guidelines that we can give to our um, law enforcement. You know, all of our. Uh, all of the recorder's offices and the elections departments, we all work with our local law enforcement. We are working as a community. We don't run and facilitate these elections by ourselves. It is an entire lift for the entire county, including for our law, law enforcement. And so I think it's really important for us to be able to point to a piece of paper and say, by statute, this is what the law is. Um, a lot of times when you when you have something like that, any single time that I have somebody who is violating the 75 foot limit, um, taking photos inside the 75 foot limit, um, or trying to electioneer in the 75 foot limit, all I have to say is you're in the 75 foot limit and it is illegal and here's the statute. And every, every single time I've ever encountered anybody, they say, oh, I didn't realize that. And then they, they go outside of the 75. If that person were then to continue to violate that knowingly, then that is cause for us to escalate that and reach out to our law enforcement and have law enforcement probably remove them. Um, but most people don't want to get into that type of situation. And so when you have those very clear statutes, um, a very clear um, what is the law, um, that you're able to convey to constituents or people who are wanting to um, intimidate others, it, it makes a very clear line. You're doing this, it is illegal, you need to stop doing this, or there are consequences. And unfortunately, we didn't have that in the 2022 cycle, um, where we saw that happening, particularly in, in Senator Bennett's territory um, in in. Uh, Yavapai was uh, where we were seeing it first, um, and then it was in Maricopa. Pima County actually doesn't have ballot drop boxes yet. Uh, this is something we're working on because it does it does expand access to voters in rural areas and, and tribal communities. Um, that is something many people cannot make it eight to five Monday through Friday to come into our offices to return their ballots. And it is their most uh, fundamental rights. Uh, we want to make sure that people are able to participate. And so being able to know that they can securely drop it in a drop box, which is used by all parties. Um, it, 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 there is no one party that is using them more than others. Um, in fact, and I, I believe uh, recorder Birchall has stated before that actually in, in Yavapai, it's, it's particularly um, her her Republican voters who are utilizing it the most, um, and but throughout the state, it, it is wide widely popular. So we we do need to have some protections there. Do you see anything coming in the legislature on that front, there, Senator? Yes, I think there'll probably be some legislation to apply the same uh, seventy five foot limits. Um, 
for voting locations to these drop boxes. Now, sometimes they're at the same location, uh, but I, I think you'll probably see something to make sure that there's no uh, electioneering or interference with voters within 75 feet of these drop boxes where they can put their uh, their ballots in. But we don't want we don't want voter intimidation anywhere, 76 feet or <laughs> anywhere. So, um, but you have to sometimes you know express these ideas in a bill or in a statute, you know, based on a specific, you know, number of feet and it's 75 feet for voting locations. So you can't be interfering or electioneering as uh, recorder mentioned, uh, we'll probably see a bill to extend that same protection range around drop boxes. Thank you. And um, we had mentioned uh, signature verification earlier, recorder Kazaris uh, Kelly. Um, when I guess your your first choice or your first option for contacting um, voters if their signature isn't matching up is the phone number on the ballot, right? Um, what other ways have you got to contact them to make sure that their their votes count if they don't feel comfortable putting that uh, phone number on the ballot, sticking it in the mail. So, it's on the envelope, by the way. <laughs> it is It is on the envelope and that is the best. Um, it is so helpful for us because people, especially in this day and age, they change their phone numbers so often. Um, they might've registered when they were 18 years old and, you know, 10 years later, they've been through 18 different phones, um, you know, getting a new model every year. Um, mine has stayed the same. <laughs> since um, the first time I got a, a mobile phone, but everybody else, um, every single one of my family members, I can't tell you how often I get that text message. Hi, Thea, this is so-and-so, here's my new number. So it is really helpful when people um, put it on the envelope. However, um, you do, when you, when you fill out a voter registration form, if you have submitted your phone number or your email address, we will try to attempt to uh, contact you that way. Um, we do send uh, physical mail letters because, of course, we have your, your physical address, your mailing address on file. Um, we're able to send out um, earlier in the election. So the people who are sending uh, their ballots back and have a question, if we have a question about their ballots and they voted, um, you know, maybe 26 days into the election cycle, we have plenty of time, we're going to send them a mail, uh, a piece of mail through the post office, we're going to send them, we're going to call them, we're going to send them a text message, we're going to email them. Um, for some of them, as we get closer um, to the election deadline, and we're not getting results, we're not um, hearing from people, we might even do something like we're going to see who else lives in the household and maybe try to call one of their phone numbers or email them and say, hey, we're trying to get a hold of, of uh, your spouse um, and, and we really need to hear back. Um, so we're, we really work very hard. We have a, a ballot resolution team here in Pima County. Um, we are trying to, to figure out ways to communicate uh, with the voters so that they have as much opportunity to hear from us and and please, if you have any questions, um, make sure that you're reaching out to your recorder's offices. My office, um, not only can you take a look online to see if we have accepted your signature, um, but you can also sign up for ballot alerts. Um, and I know that's true for Maricopa County and a couple other counties um, where we will send you the information of number one, your ballot is on its way. Number two, we've received it back. Next, we have verified uh, your signature, and we've sent it over to elections. Um, if at any time we are having an issue, we're able to reach out to that voter and say, we're having an issue um, with your ballot, please contact our office. Um, and we try to make it as easy as possible for people um, to connect with our offices. At, at what point, um, you know, if you can't contact the person, at, at what point do you say, well, you, you can't count the ballot? Um, but it's, it depends on the election because every single thing that we do is dependent on statute. Um, and so we just finished up an election cycle, uh, literally yesterday, um, or today would be the deadline five days after five business days after an election. Um, but in a federal election, uh, where there's a federal race, it is, uh, 10 days after the election. 
um, or we're still trying to contact voters, um, which a lot of times people are really, really angry about um, why we haven't closed elections. It's really important for people to know that the recorder's offices and the elections directors, we're not being impacted by media. We are being impacted by statute. We are obligated to follow the law and ensure that every single eligible ballot counts. Um, and so we're doing everything we can to make sure that that ballot is eligible, that that voter is eligible, that they're registered on time. Um, all of those things, um, we're doing that and we do not stop until we have reached the statutory deadline and there's absolutely nothing else we can do. Um, and so that's why you'll see maybe 99% of all ballots counted um, with a small percentage um, of, of ballots that still need to be resolved um, after the election. And Gary, as a, a clarification to what Gabriella said, um, there's a five to 10 day window to fix problems if your signature doesn't match or you forgot to sign the ballot uh, envelope, but your ballot has to be in the possession of the election officials by 7 p.m. on election night. So that five to 10 day window is not for more and more ballots to show up and, and still get into the uh, into the count. Uh, your ballot has to be in their possession by 7 p.m. on election night. And, and then the five and the five to 10 days is for uh, addressing issues as uh, recorder Kazadas Kelly was mentioning. And it has to be signed. If we uh, up until if we receive a, a ballot affidavit with no signature before the election, we're going to call that voter and say, we received your ballot. It didn't have a signature. We can send you another one if, if we have time. If not, we're going to say, go vote on election day. Um, otherwise, your vote's not going to count. We can't add your signature after the fact. Um, but after election day, if you drop off your ballot on election day and it doesn't have a signature and we don't see that until the next day, you cannot add your signature to um, to your ballot. You we have to we have to have something on file that says this was the person's intention. Um, and sometimes we'll see people who have like broken hands, uh, you know, or we call them up and that's what the, the reason is. Um, that their signature looks a little funky, um, or maybe, um, you know, they they just changed it over time, or they were in a rush, or they they signed it on their dashboard. Um, and we have a whole bunch of reasons, and people will say, yes, they will confirm their identity over the phone. We have questions that we ask the voter. Um, we confirm their identity, and then we say, was it your intention to vote this ballot? And if it is, then we're able to uh, resolve that ballot and it'll it'll be uh, sent over for tabulation. All right. So we got two minutes left and there's one more subject I wanted to squeeze in. Um, and I apologize that, it, you know, we're squeezing it in like this, but misinformation. Um, what are you folks seeing out there? Where are you seeing it? And, and what is it that we're seeing? I'll go. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, my my caution to voters is, you know, um, we know social media is um, a very um, popular place to post opinions and, and information and, and links. And I would just, you know, urge voters to pause. So when you see something on there that could potentially impact your vote or somebody else's vote, please pause. And, and if you're considering, you know, um, reposting that information, please verify it first before you do it, just to confirm the accuracy of it, because you don't want to, you know, inadvertently contribute to misinformation. And then, you know, and if it's going to impact your vote or concerns that you have, um, reach out again to your local elections office, because there is a lot of information and there's a lot of opinions um, about elections. And so, you know, we have to, and, and some of, um, there's, you know, misinformation, which maybe isn't done intentionally, um, but then we have malinformation, which is really, you know, the purpose is to to deceive you. And, and so we want to make sure that voters 
know to go to those trusted sources. Again, we've mentioned this before, it's gonna be your 15 county recorders, your 15 uh, county elections offices, the secretary of state's office and clean elections. And so just pause and take a moment to reach out to verify this information. Um, because I, I assure you, you know, most of the time, once you talk to your elections official, then it's gonna make sense. And so um, we are, often seeing a lot of misinformation and, and um, again, I'm calling opinions too, but misinformation out there on social media. And so it really is, um, we want voters to be proactive in that, in that pausing, you know, don't contribute to it by reposting it and then, you know, providing your commentary on it, please reach out to your ele elected officials and help us fight that misinformation because we want all voters to have accurate info. Of course, there's your website, there's the county recorders, secretaries of state, um, mm -hmm. and the Arizona Capital Times. So, um, <laughs> and feel free to call our offices. We, we specifically get people on the phone so that we can, we can answer your questions. Don't be afraid to call your local, um, recorders offices. Um, this is what we do. We do it all day. We're here to answer your questions. Um, so if you're kind of, a, if you're getting confused with things that you're seeing online, just pick up the phone and give us a call. Yes, absolutely. Call your election officials because, you know, Google's great, but let's remember that Google is a search engine. <laughs> and so when you're typing in your information there, there's no guarantee that what you're getting in those, you know, first page of results is necessarily going to be the factual information. So um, phone call, you know, emailing your election offices directly, that's your best bet. All right. Well, that that's it for our time today. And I uh, really appreciate the audience for joining us. Uh, thank you, Senator Bennett, uh, Recorder Cazares Kelly, Roy, and Gina. Thank you, and um, thank uh, you know. I want to thank also thank the Clean Elections Commission, and um, hope everybody has a good day. Thank you. Bye.